we're continuing our look verse by verse through our Apostle Paul's book of 1 Corinthians. Now, we began looking at chapter 13 last week, so let's, let's read a couple of verses for review, and we'll get in, right into the study. Paul says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And what we looked at is we, we went over this passage about Paul, and we went through it in detail. So by the time you listen to this, you should be able to look at that one in review. But we saw that the Apostle Paul, his unique apostleship, he was able to communicate not only in all the tongues of humanity, but even in the tongue of the angelic realm. He was able to go up there in 2 Corinthians 14 when he was stoned in Acts, and, and, and excuse me, 2 Corinthians 12 when he was stoned in Acts 14, and he was able to communicate up there with those angels, but he couldn't speak it down here, okay? There's, there's that, there's that, it was unlawful for a man to speak. Paul had all those blessings from the Lord Jesus. But if he didn't have charity, today we're going to look at in detail what is charity. He says in verse number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and have all knowledge and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. Now, when, when it comes to that, Paul says, I have the gift of prophecy. Paul was able to not only speak forth God's word, Paul as an apostle, as a prophet, he could foretell what would happen. God gave him the special ability to speak his word and to foretell what would happen. He says, and understand all mysteries. Up in this point in Paul's ministry, the, the mystery of Christ is being written. It's being revealed by revelation. In 2 Corinthians, he says, I will come to visions and revelations. Paul understood everything that God has now revealed through the ministry of the apostle. He says, and I have all knowledge. He knew everything that God was doing in, in the world up until that point. He says, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains. Now remember, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he talks about faith, he tells his little flock in, in, in the Gospels, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea. God has put a lot of power in the faith of a human being. It is faith that pleases God. Without faith, it is impossible to please Him. And Paul had enough faith that he could, if, if he wanted to, remove mountains, multiple mountains. It says, but if I have not charity, verse 2, I am what? Nothing. And what charity is, remember what we saw charity was? The dictionary defines it as the act of giving money or food or other kinds of help to those in need, you know, those who are poor and sick. And that's good. That's a good definition of it. But it's more than that in Scripture, okay? What charity is in Scripture is it's a heart attitude. It's more than just actions. It's what's behind the actions, the motivation. Where God's love, it starts in the inward man. Charity, we're going to see, is the only thing that lasts forever. Your human body... All the spiritual gifts that were in operation, anything else in this world won't last, but what will is charity, and we're going to be looking at that, okay? Uh, let me put something on the board. When you see that word charity, some people name their children charity, usually their daughters, or, or we, we, have a, we have a cousin on Christmas side named Karis, you know, uh, sometimes spelled with a K, charismatic. You hear people talk about charismatic. That man's charismatic order is a denomination called charismatic. What that charis is, you see that word charis, that's of the Holy Spirit. That represents the Holy Spirit. And what charity is, it's a love that is generated, generated by the Spirit of God. Okay? So this is not something that a lost person can have. Lost people donate to charities and so forth. We talked about all the charities, goodwill, um, the Red Cross and Salvation Army, all that. But they do it generated by their own selfish, it makes me feel good. I'm helping people, but I feel good. That's not what charity. Charity is only what saints, believers can have. It's a love generated by the Spirit of God. And another word of saying that, it is motivated by the mind of Christ, okay? The mind of Christ. Because there is some suffering when it comes to charity, but there's going to be some glory. You're going to be rewarded for it, okay? It may not be in this world, but it will be in the time to come. So let's go over that. Charity, charismatic. Charismatic is related to the Holy Spirit. Charity is a love generated by the Spirit of God, or also the mind of Christ. There's going to be some suffering, but there's going to be glory as well. 
So we're going to look at some verses throughout to see how this, this word charity is, is used. Charity in the Bible is also called the labor of love. It is also called the love of God, okay? Now let's go through some verses and seeing that. Go back, if you will, to chapter 8. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter number 8. And when we talk about charity, the love of God, that which is generated by the Spirit of God, God has one goal in mind, and that's to build you up. God has a love for the believer, for man, but mostly the believer, obviously. He responds lovingly towards people who trust his son. God is looking to build you up. Verse Chapter 8, uh, of verse 1. We're going to uh, go over these verses. Uh, Ryan had brought up a, um, a verse from last week. We, we didn't look at it last week, but it's in the study day. A good connection here. But look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now it's touching things offered unto idols. We know that we all have knowledge. Notice he says, knowledge puffeth up, puffeth up. If you're using just that knowledge for your own selfish needs, okay? And in particular uh, here, it was meat sacrificed to idols and so forth. And it was, it was being a stumbling block to other brethren. Notice he says, knowledge puffeth up, but charity does what? Edifieth, okay? That issue of charity, that love that's generated by the Spirit of God, that love that is from the mind of Christ, that builds people up. Go back to the book of Romans chapter 14. Let's see another uh, issue with that. Um, it's not a big issue in our day, but meat sacrificed to idols in Paul's day was huge. Because the Jews were forbidden by God to eat certain unclean meats, and particularly meat sacrificed to gods, those, uh, those idols. But now that we are in the dispensation of grace, God doesn't forbid certain meats, okay? He doesn't make unclean meats and clean meats like he did with Israel. By the way, why did God separate meats with Israel? Why doesn't he do it today? Because Israel was to be a separated people. Uh, we were talking with David during the Q&A. We were talking about the nation of Israel. And God has separated that nation from all other nations in his prophetic program. And by doing that, he even separated their meats. Okay? Well, today in the dispensation of grace, God has set Israel aside. He's dealing with both Jew and Gentile. Okay? In one body. And there's no unclean meats today. There's no unclean meats. I'm just letting you know the whole reason God separated Israel's meats in the first place was to teach them that they're a separated people. And the reason he doesn't separate meats today is because there's no separation. God deals with both Jew and Gentile, okay? It's symbolic. But notice what he says in chapter 14 of Romans. Look at Romans chapter 14 and he says verse number 20. For meat destroy not the work of God. And the work of God here is building up a believer. God is a builder. Okay? I mean, the Lord Jesus Christ, what was his, what was his occupation? He was a carpenter, right? What does a carpenter do? He builds things. So even in his vocation as a, as a Jew, he built things. Interesting enough that the Apostle Paul, during his, during his earthly, uh, uh, during his ministry, during his life, and, and part of his ministry before he was set aside financially, he was a tent maker. What is a tent maker? He builds, he builds a tabernacle. He built tents. Paul is a builder of the temple of God. See? Don't destroy, look at verse 20, for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure. You can have all those meats. But it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. You can have the meat. But if it offends your brother or sister, don't eat it in their presence. Notice right here in verse 21. It is, neither, it is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. You know, religion says, well, you can't do this, you can't do that, you can't drink this, you can't drink... Well, God doesn't put those restrictions on it. I tell people when Israel... When they had the tithing system, they went to worship. We saw the verses where they would have wine, or their beer, they call it strong drink, whatever. But they used it to worship the Lord. Paul says here, he says, uh, look at verse four, uh, 21 again, 20, uh, 21, 14, 21. 
It is good neither to eat flesh nor drink wine. He's speaking in the presence of a brother, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Now watch how he ends verse 23, 22. Has thou faith? Do you know from God's word that's permissible? Have it to who? Thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in a thing which he allowed. So you, and it's between you and the Lord. But if that, if that thing offends a brother or sister, you don't do it in their presence. See, that's what charity. That's why he says, go back to uh, verse number 15. Start at verse 14, Romans 14, 14. You don't want to put a stumbling block in your brother's way. Start at verse 13. Let us, let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather. You want to be a, a, a righteous judge? We're called to judge and make discernment. God is saying use the mind of Christ. Use the love that is generated by the Spirit of God. Here's what charity is. It is a it is charity care is Holy Spirit. It's the love generated by the Spirit of God in a believer, but also called the mind of Christ. Here's how you ought to judge and discern life. Here we go. Verse number 13. Let us not therefore judge one another anymore, but judge this rather. That no man put a what? Stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus, Paul writes. Now, Paul was a Jew who had separated meats in time past. And meats, when I say separated, remember, God separated because Israel was a separated nation. Paul never ate any meats that were, that were sacrificed to idols when he was Saul. But he now knows that the meat is nothing. We went over all that in chapter number 8 of 1 Corinthians. Now, here we go. <clears throat> Verse 14. I know and am persuaded by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of it of itself. But to him that esteemeth anything to be unclean, now don't miss the next two words, to him it is what? Unclean. See, that's the conscience of the person. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not what? Charitably. What would the Holy Spirit do? What would the mind of Christ do? It wouldn't offend with that meat. It would eat it outside of its presence. Because notice about that you can destroy a person's edification. What they're building up. Verse 15. Destroy not him with thy meat for whom Christ died. Be very careful on not being a stumbling block in the edification of others. Okay? Alright. Go back, if you will, to chapter 4 of, of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 4. So we're going to be going through some passages about how to walk charitably using the Apostle Paul, okay? Notice what Paul says here. He was getting on the, the uh, Corinthians because they were puffed up. They didn't deal with the sin in that, in that assembly that was rampant, the, the leaven that was leavening the whole lump. In 1 Corinthians 4, look at verse 21. Paul says, I'm going to come there to see you guys. And, and we're going to judge who, who, who's got power from God. One thing that Paul, as, a, as an apostle, a prophet would do. You remember Elijah? If you haven't read this, read on your own time, 1 Kings. The prophet Elijah, there was 450 prophets of Baal under Jezebel, that scandalous woman, uh, queen of Israel, and her weak husband Ahab, the king. And it was a battle between the prophets of Baal, 450 I believe, and one man of God, Elijah. And Elijah said, if you, let's see who is really God's man. They did all their stuff. They cut themselves. They offered sacrifice to Baal, and, and nothing happened. Elijah said, put some water on everything. Soak it, soak it. And he says, God will call down fire from heaven, and it soaked up everything. Elijah was God's man. And what God's men will do is say, let's prove. Come on, let's, let's get together. Let's contest and see who, who got the power of God. And that's what Paul is saying here. These people were going against his apostleship. Some, verse 21, look at chapter 4, verse 21. What will ye? He said, what do you want when I get there? Shall I come unto you with a what? A rod. You know what a rod is, children? Yeah. A rod is used to beat. A rod is for a fool's back, it says in Scripture. 
Paul says, I can come with the rod. I can come and, 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 and beat you down if you want. That's not what I want to do. Notice in verse 21, or in love and in the spirit of meekness. That word love there is the same one that, that's, that's the word charity, okay? Paul says, I can come with a love generated by the spirit of God. And what he's going to do is he's going to come and edify them. That's his own goal. His only goal is to edify and build up these believers, okay? Let's look at more. Go over to chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Look at verse number 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and verse 14. So as we look at the Apostle Paul, what he says and what he does, you're going to see this issue of being, you know, who truly is a charismatic you know, the charismatic movement, they believe that there's Holy Spirit-led gifts and so forth. There was in, time, in, that, in that time. But really, it's not the gifts that's the issue because the Corinthians had all the gifts. It was their heart at, it was the heart that's the issue. It was the heart issue, the motivation and so forth. They had all the gifts. They were charismatic as far as the charismatic movement. But really, charismatic means, are you operating in the Holy Ghost? Is your love generated by the Spirit of God? Are you using the mind of Christ? And even these people with the gifts were not. Paul had to rebuke them. Let's keep looking at it. Chapter 16, as he ends the book, notice what he says at the end. Verse 14. Start at verse number uh, 13. We talk about watchings from, from, from Ephesians, uh, Philippians. Watch ye. That means be, be, be mindful of what's going on around you, spiritually. Stand fast in the faith. Hold on to the mystery of Christ. Keep that faith. And then he says, quit ye like men. Quit ye like men. What does that mean? Act like men. And what is a man to, supposed to be? Strong. When God talks about a man, he talks about strength. Spiritual strength. Even how God made a man's body physically is supposed to represent what he wants a man to do. He tells, he tells Job, he says, quit yourself like a man. Let's talk about why I created you. And he says, be strong. He's talking about strong in the faith. Verse 14, let all your things be done with what? Charity. Listen, everything we do, the motivation behind it should be charity. The love generated by the Spirit of God or the mind of Christ to edify and build up others. That's how you live as a believer. So when you wake up and you pray to the Lord, you th think about the day, you say, how can I build another person up? Okay? That's, the, that's what life in Christ is all about. Let's look at a few more of these. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. <clears throat> And Paul, as our pattern, our example, he, he puts this on display. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, look at verse 6. Now the Thessalonians were putting on display this charity. Look at verse number 6. But now when Timotheus, that's Timothy, came from you unto us, Paul sent Timothy back to Thessalonica. Let me give you a, because I always know some people may not be familiar with what's going on. In First Thessalonica, excuse me, in Acts 17, Paul goes to Thessalonica. There was a big uproar because of Paul's ministry, and so they kicked him out of there. He couldn't go back to first, he couldn't go back to Thessalonica, but he sent Timothy back. And Paul was wondering, did all that tribulation that happened when I was there, did it cause you guys to fall away from the faith? And that's true. I, I can tell you what, and this is true, I was, we were talking to Ryan. It's hard to even leave for a week because Satan, even like when we would go back to when we went back to Minnesota or like when Ryan went up to Thailand, it's like Satan takes the opportunity to try to attack. Even he's always looking for weakness, try to get in there, a foothold. When Paul left, man, the policy of evil got even stronger. Everywhere Paul would go, he would then leave, and here comes the devil through men trying to mess things up. It happens. But guess what these guys did? They held strong in the faith. Look at what he says. Verse 5. Speaking of the tribulation. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, he was thinking about them, I sent to know your what? Faith. faith. He says, I wanted to see if you guys were sticking with it. I understand that. Paul is right. Lest by some means 
The tempter, who is that? That's Satan, right? He called the tempter, have tempted you and our labor be in vain. I mean, I can imagine the apostle, he can't go back. He'd get arrested. Not only would he get arrested, he doesn't care about that, but the people like Jason and these people who, who, who met with Paul, the civil authorities would attack them too. They said, if we see that guy Paul there, we're going to arrest all of you guys. Paul says, I, nope, you guys need to be doing the ministry. I'll stay away, but I will send Timothy. Now watch what happened. Paul's worried about what happened. Verse 6. But now when Timotheus came from you to us, that's Paul and Silas and so forth, and brought us what type of tidings? Good tidings of your faith and charity. Oh, can I show you guys something? Notice the two things he mentioned first. He says your faith and your charity. So keep that in mind. So we're going we're gonna to be breaking this down. But another thing. And that ye have good remembrance of us always. Oh, that's fantastic. They always had a good mind towards the Apostle Paul and those men with him. Desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Verse 7. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our affliction and distress by your faith. For now we live and ye stand fast in the Lord. You know what Paul's saying? As we go through these tribulations, knowing that there are other faithful saints who are enduring too, we're all right. You know what a local ministry is? What we have here is a place where you can come and there are people just like you who believe the same thing and going through the same thing. I pretty much heard it all over the years in ministry. People will write me. I'm going to give you guys next Sunday, we're going to look, look at some uh, encouraging email. People write almost every day, and, and people want to tell me their testimony, what they're going through. And I can tell you, once you learn the rightly divided word, you start sharing it, the satanic attack comes, and, and pretty much they all going through the same things, whether it's relationship-wise, whether it's old, the old church, and all these things. Well, there's a place that you know there are people who are like precious faith but going through the same things. We all are going to struggle, not struggle, we're all going to be going through these tribulations because the, the satanic attack is on us because we believe the truth of the mystery. Well, that's what Paul says. There's faith, there's charity, and there's, what we're going to see is they're enduring suffering. Now, I, I, I'm going to write them like that, enduring sufferings, okay? Now watch this. These three major components make up the life of a grace believer. If you, if you endure these things, if you're doing these things, you're going to get a full reward of the inheritance, a full reward. Okay? Well, I'll say it like this. You're going to be rewarded, because only, only the Lord knows, because we lack in some things. But you're going to be rewarded. You're going to get reward of the inheritance. Where he puts you out there, or where the Father puts you out there, that's between the Father and the Son. But if you have these three things, you see that faith and charity? Let me show you how he says it over in chapter 1. Go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Your life as a believer is broke down in these three categories. I want you to remember this always. Notice 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 3. Remembering without ceasing Paul as he prays for them. What does When Paul prayed for believers, what did he pray for? Look at verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our what? Prayers. So what was Paul praying to God about for these believers? This is fantastic. This will tell you how to pray. Remembering without ceasing your what? Your work of faith. See, there's your work right there. The work of faith, being a workman. You have to study the Bible. What you're doing right now is the work of faith. As you guys listen right now, you're doing the work of faith. We're doing it together. But also, he remembers something else. Notice here, he says, the, the fan blew my thing here. Here we go. Remember without ceasing your work of faith and what? Labor of love. Ah. Over there in chapter 3, he says charity, but here he calls it labor of love. Now, can I tell you about labor? It's hard. You, you know the difference between work and labor in the Bible? Because I looked this up, I studied, people say, what's the difference between work and labor? Work takes, so it, it takes, this takes energy, okay? But it doesn't necessarily, it's not necessarily hard. You know, you go to work, some people go to work, sit there for eight hours, 
do nothing and you go home. Do <laughs> a nice cushy job. But not a laborer. Uh -uh. The, the word labor, it, it, it has to do with some hardness, okay? It's hot. You're working outside. We have we have a, a brother in the Lord, Wade, in, in Minnesota. He works he works six months out of the year during the you can't work outside in the wintertime in Minnesota. You just can't. You can't, they can't do road construction. Too much snow, too much ice, too much rain. So for six months during the summer months, from about May on through, he gets all this work in 16 hours a day, right? Does he's a road, he's he, he's a paver of the roads or something. He's always tanned and stuff. But then for the winter months, he just leaves town. He, he, he got it. He just goes. He's a snowbird. He's like 39 years old. Well, what, what, what our brother does and his construction guy, that labor, man. See, there's, the, there's energy in the work. The work of faith. That's what y'all doing here. You're sitting here. You're thinking about some things. You're sitting here. But then the labor of love. You're taking what you're learning and you're putting it into practice. See, that takes, that's, that's hard. That's hard. But it's the labor of love. You're doing it to build others up. But when you do those two, Satan takes notice. Oh, when people say, oh, I'll never fall away, Satan will never give. I said, don't you do that to me. You better respect our ancient adversary. Don't give him more of a, of a focus on you. That's ridiculous. <laughs> no, stupid. It's, it's idiotic. This, he, he, got, he got angels who, who see God every day to fall away from God. You think he, he's been dealing with man for six thousand? No, no, no. So you need to have a healthy respect. You, not a fear, but a respect. Because the sufferings are going to come, but they're going to be used for your glory. That's what Christ... So this one is called the Enduring Sufferings. Notice what he says here. Notice what I... Uh, I know it by heart, but I just want us to look at it. Remembering, 1 Thessalonians 1, 3, remembering without ceasing your what? Work of faith... And labor of love and what? Patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. So what is those enduring sufferings? It's called the what? Patience of hope. And what that hope is, it's the hope of the gospel, which is to reign with Christ. Remind me, a guy just emailed me today. I saw it. I didn't have time to respond this morning. Colossians 1. That that hope of the gospel. I, I want to. We want to see. I'm going to see that uh, hope of the gospel. Um, over in Romans chapter number five, Paul says, "Therefore, being justified, how by faith we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access. As a believer, you have access, but it's by faith into this grace where we stand and we rejoice in hope." Of the what? Glory of God. We're going to share in His glory. We're going to reign with Him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. But if you deny Him, if you deny Him, 2 Timothy 2, 12 and 13, uh, 12, He will deny you the glory, the reigning. Okay? The whole gospel of grace has to do with a hope of sharing in the glory of God in the heavenly places. That's why we do Work of faith, labor of love. So another word for charity is the labor of love, okay? But there's another one. Let's keep going. Look with me, if you will, at 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 3. Paul makes it easy. He makes them 1, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians 1, 3. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. All right. What does he say when he writes the second epistle? A couple of years later. Here we go. 2 Thessalonians 1, 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is meet or fit or proper. Because your faith groweth what? Exceedingly. So, another way of saying work of faith is your faith grows exceedingly. You're, you're taking advantage as you redeem the time, you're learning God's word, your faith ought to grow as well. The more of God's word you know, if you believe it, you get to grow. So that's what the work of faith is. Learn the word, believe the word. My job is to help you understand God's word. If it's something you don't understand now, I tell you what I did in the past. I believe God's word. I said, Father, I don't, I don't grasp that. This is early. I was just like, I don't grasp that. I put that sucker on the shelf. I put it right there. 
I would ask other men and so forth, other brothers, if, if they couldn't help me, I'd say, okay, God, I need your, you know, to time. And what happens as you grow in the Word, you start growing and understanding. So if it's something that you don't understand, just put it on the shelf. Say, Lord, give me that understanding down the road, but believe it. Just because you don't understand it, don't not believe it, believe it. Your faith grow at exceeding. But notice, charity is also labor of love. But watch how it is in this passage. Verse number 3. We are bound to thank God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because that your faith groweth exceedingly, and the charity of every one of you uh, all toward each other aboundeth, so, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all your persecutions you endure. So here, he uses the word charity, 2 Thessalonians. So labor of love and charity, okay? He says here... Um, Verse 4, so that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith and all. So enduring. So you see that? Patience, faith, enduring. So I just want you to see there's the work of faith. You're doing what you're doing now. Once you believe it, it's the labor of love, God working in you. That's God's love working in you. And then when you do all that, Satan's policy of evil comes and attacks, and you just endure that knowing that you're going to reign with him. Let me show you that. Go to Colossians 1. Go to Colossians 1. When Paul talks about the hope of the gospel, that's what he's saying. It's not just... <laughs> it's so funny. I, the stuff I hear over the years is hilarious. <laughs> Getting saved is not just about you. Okay? It's not about you. It's not about us. Yes, God wants to keep you out of hell. That's why his son died for you. But that's just the beginning. Salvation is... Hey, but he's coming. Salvation, being saved, is yes, from the eternal penalty, penalty of your sins, okay? For sins. And that is hell and a lake of fire, okay? When you get saved, when you trust the blood of Christ for your, for, for your only uh, uh, salvation, you're saved from hell and the lake of fire. You're not going to hell, you're not going to go to the lake of fire, no matter how you live your life, okay? That's what grace is. You have everlasting life. But God also saved you for a bigger reason, and that is to share His glory. He, he wants some members of the body of Christ to rule and reign, to rule and reign in the heavenly places in Christ's stead. The Lord Jesus is going to be on the earth, but He owns everything, and it's you and I that God has created. Notice, that's what the gospel is. The gospel is about that. It's not just being saved, it's sharing in Christ's glory. Notice here in Colossians 1, he's going to say it right here too. Notice in chapter number 1, verse 3. With, with, with faithful saints, Paul is always thanking God. Verse number 3, we give thanks to God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying always for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, okay, everybody look up here. Remember, remember the uh, the work of faith, work of faith, right? Which was also called your faith grow. It grow is growing. Notice he says your faith in Christ Jesus, and the what, and the love which he have to all saints, the love for saints, loving saints. What is that? That's called charity. It's called the labor of love. And another place is called the love of God. The love of God. It's God's love. It's the love generated by the Spirit of God. Okay? So your faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all the saints. By the way, let me I gotta get this in there. What's the fruits of fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ? Paul says that the breastplate is the breastplate of righteousness. Okay? He calls it that. But he also calls it the breastplate of faith and love. Here, that's Ephesians. Six, breastplate of righteousness. But Paul in 1 Thessalonians 5 calls it the breastplate of faith and love. So let's just add two and two. What is righteousness? It's faith and love. It's faith in the Lord Jesus and love to all saints. That's what you're going to be rewarded for. Righteous is faith and love. So the work of faith, the love to all the saints. Let's keep going. Verse 4, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, and of the love which ye have to all the saints. But notice why they're doing it. For the hope which is laid up for you, where? 
in heaven. Where have you heard before in the word of the truth of the gospel? Listen, that hope of the gospel, hope of the gospel, is the fact that when you do these two, really three, because you got you got to keep doing that, so you're gonna you're gonna face persecution, uh, suffering. The hope of the gospel is that you're going to reign, you're going to be glorified, you're going to receive glory of God or reigning with Him. That's why we do what we do. That's why God gave the gospel of grace. Go down, if you will, to, um, let's see here. Yes, verse 23. Colossians 1, 2, 3. If you continue in the what? Faith. What's that? That's this. If, if you continue, if you, when the sufferings come, you don't, you don't give up. You endure them. You endure. Endure or continue. You know what Paul says, right? The time will come when they will not endure what? Sound doctrine. But they're going to say, I can't, I can't deal with that, so give me somebody to teach me something else. They're going to heat themselves teachers, have an engineer. That won't get you glory in the heavenly places. What it gets you glory if you can endure sound doctrine, Paul's doctrine, continue. Notice right here. Verse, verse 23 says, if, if ye continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not what? Moved away from the hope of the gospel, which ye have heard and which was preached to every creature which is under heaven, whereby Paul made. What's the hope of the gospel? Paul says, listen, if you do the things I tell you, God's going to give you his glory. He's going to let you reign in Christ's stead in heavenly places. Won't you just believe it? And this, this stuff is not being taught in churches. Churches are not teaching this. Everything is about the earth, the earth, the earth. On Wednesday, we're going to be seeing they mind earthly thing. It's about the earth and earth. Come on, bless me with this, Father. Give me that, give me this, give me this. When Paul says, no, our conversation is where? Set your, mind, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. We're going to see all that Wednesday. But this is what Paul's, Paul is saying. That's the hope of the gospel, okay? All right, let's keep going. Go to Colossians 3. Look at verse 14. Colossians 3, verse 14. And above all these things, and you can read them, he's talking about all the things that become saints, put on charity... Look how he describes charity, which is the bond. You know that word bond is like a glue. It's like glue. When you glue something together, you ever, you ever, have you ever got crazy glue on your fingers? You know, you, 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 you're using that crazy glue and it gets on your fingers. Your fingers, you can, your, your skin comes off, doesn't it? That's what he's talking about. That's what a bond, like a bond, like crazy. Think when you see that word bond, think crazy glue. Because it, what, what, watch what he says here. Verse number um, 14. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. The bond of spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity shows itself in building up others. Building up others. Okay? That's what charity is. Serving, building up others. By love, serve one another. But the bond of it, the glue of it, of your spiritual maturity is, if you get busy using what God has given you to build up others, that is, that'll, that'll cement. That's another word, cement. Cement. You know what bothers me when these guys go out there working, they put the cement down, and somebody mess with the cement, put their handprint right in there. Right. We were watching, it was like, it was like, such and such love, such and such. <laughs> they put the date. So it's, 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 it's ever in the cement, right? That drives me crazy because I, I like to see the. That's what that is. It, it, it just cements it. What cements your spiritual maturity is in a life of building up others, okay? Using your life as a sacrifice to build others up. That's what Paul is saying. All right, a couple more. Go with me to um, 1 Timothy chapter 1. 1 Timothy chapter 1. I don't know. I'm a stick with Peru. I never was tempted to, to do that when I saw that. <laughs> I remember this one movie where this guy, he wanted to put his face in the cement. So he just, <laughs> they smashed his face in the cement, but it didn't come out right. It's not like a hand like they do on Hollywood Boulevard. 
put your little hand prints and you ever went down there? First time we went down there, you could see this little Hollywood Walker thing, and you, everybody's putting their hands. Oh, this is Michael Jackson. Let me see. You know, that was the only one I checked out. Michael, I grew up on Michael. That works, but don't put your face in there. Okay, that was ridiculous. Well, and that was a comedy, so they were being silly about it. Look at First Timothy chapter number one, verse three. One verse three. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, Paul says, stay at Ephesus. Paul went into Macedonia, that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other what? Doctrine. doctrine. Paul's doctrine, the sound doctrine, the doctrine was according to God, as he calls it here. That talks about the mystery. Neither give heed to fables. Anybody know what fables is? Just a bunch of stories, right? Just a bunch of tall tales, right? No, no, no. Look, in preaching, there is a there is a there is a place for illustration, but when these guys just go everything they talk about is some, some story, and then you're not looking at verses or barely looking at verses, that's nonsense. Neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies, which was huge in, in that day amongst the Jews, which minister questions rather than all oh, godly edifying, which is in faith. So do what is Paul saying? Godly edifying is the issue. Now, why did he give that commandment? Look at verse 5. Now, the end of that of the commandment, by the way, people say, are there commandments from God through the Apostle Paul? Yes. Now, the end of the commandment, there are grace commandments. Paul says, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things I write unto him, the mystery, the gospel of grace, are the commandments of the Lord. So there are grace commandments. Verse 5. Now the end of the commandment is charity out of a pure heart. Having the right doctrine, the mystery, should produce, if it's done right, charity out of a pure heart. That's why I told you charity is not just the action, it's the motivation. Notice here, and of a good conscience, and of, un of faith unfeigned, Unfeigned means it's, it's, it's not false. It's not pretend. From which some, having swerved, have turned aside unto what? Vain jangling. Remember Paul says like a tingling symbol? Anything that's not the mystery being taught is just vain jangling. And the more you get used to hearing the message of the Apostle Paul, when you listen to preachers on TV, hooping and hollering and him and hawing and stuff, it's just vain jangling. You, I can't endure that stuff. <laughs> listen. Verse 7, desire to be teachers of the law. The law was taught in the earthly ministry of Christ. Desire to be teachers of the law, understanding neither what they say, these guys are clueless, nor whereof they are firm. They're putting a, a program on believers that God has not given for us today. All right? So I just want you to see that charity is huge throughout Paul's epistles. Now, Go back to 1 Corinthians. We've got about 15 minutes. Go back to 1 Corinthians, chapter 14. Oh, excuse me, 13. 1 Corinthians, chapter 13. Now, Paul's going to go and give some details about what charity is, how it, what it looks like, what it feels like, how it's manifest. All right, so what did we learn today? That charity... That word charity, charis, charismatic. Charismatic, it means of the Holy Spirit. Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, okay. Charity is the love produced by God, the Holy Spirit, or it's the mind of Christ. That's what we learned, okay? That's why only believers can do this, because you've got to be saved to do it, okay? Now, how is the God towards us? Look at, look at chapter number 13, verse number 3. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, that's what most people think charity is, you know, giving up to the poor. And though I give my body to be burned, you know, I think about, they talk about the ultimate sacrifice of, of soldiers. And, and on a, in a world viewpoint, that is good. Um, you know, you're in a foxhole with some guys. I got a lot of World War II veterans that I drive around in my senior home. 95-year-old guys, they were in the war. And they still have vivid memories. One guy was telling me that he was in a foxhole with these guys, with his, with his 
Uh, what do they call it, Benicia? Uh, what would that be? Oh, wait. That is squad? Yeah, a squad. I don't know. Yeah. You, you know okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a squad that drew. All right, yeah. Right. <laughs> well, they're over there in, in, in Europe fighting for the, for the Allied nations and so, so forth against Hitler. And here comes a grenade or something came, some type of bomb with, you know, explosive device. And one of his guys jumps on the thing mm -hmm. to protect his guys. He took the breath. He died, obviously. He was blown to bits, but he, he saved his guys, you know. That old saying, all give some, but some give all. And that guy did. And these guys remember that vividly. One guy, he was a tail gunner in a World War II uh, um, airplane. And he'd see his guys he trained with, and, and, and they get shot out the skies. They're, they're, you know, they're way up there. He's watching them get shot up, blown up the sky. These are the guys he trained with. They still, this man, 95, he has these vivid memories of this. This body to be burned. So there is some profit for others. If, if you give goods to the poor, it will profit the poor. If you gave your body to be burned or something, it could profit someone. You could protect others. Okay? But what Paul is talking about is something that is motivated by the Spirit of God, something that is internal. I mean, look, the Muslims, they blow themselves up all the time. They pack some explosives on them, walk into a marketplace or a bus in Jerusalem, and blow up everybody with themselves. What's that going to get them? It's not going to get them paradise with 72 virgins and sitting on a, a sea, a, 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 a river of wine, drinking with his women. You're going to hell because you're lost. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. There's no profit to that. They don't have a, a love that's motivated by Almighty God. Notice in verse 3, Paul says, it profited me, what? Nothing. It may profit others, but it's not going to do anything for you. Now, with the time we have left, let's break down what Paul talks about charity. And the number one thing he says about charity, or God's type of love, and it's, it is, it's amazing, the number one thing about God's love is, it's what? It suffers, keyword suffers, how long? Long. Long. <laughs> Tell you, man, true love, true love, it is some suffering involved. It's the fact, because that's how God loves. He suffers long. Patient. Yeah. And, well, that's the definition of, thank you, Dorothy. What, I wrote it down. What long suffering is, it's patiently, so Dorothy said patiently. It's patiently, watch this, enduring, so thank you, Dorothy, that's exactly what it is. patience is there. Patiently enduring lasting offense, lasting offense or, or uh, hardship. Now, how does God do that? Because if you created mankind in the world, and a majority, 99.9% .9 of the world, has always rejected you as their creator, that's some long-suffering. Because if I was God, I'd just kill them all. Man. I started off as a youth pastor about 18, 19 years ago, and then little Danielle, she's not little anymore, she's in her late 20s, but she says, Pastor Ron, why doesn't God just kill Satan? Children. They look at it, God's powerful, Satan causing all this trouble, just destroy him, man. I said, he will, he will. But I was trying to teach this little, little girl that God is a long-suffering God. He's working some things. He's a God of process. We may not understand it fully, especially as a child. We say, let's just end this thing, but God is on a time schedule. He's a process God. He's doing something both in heaven and earth. And as you grow and understand of God's word, you can see it. But God is a God that is long-suffering. Let's look at that. Go to Exodus chapter 34. Real famous passage about Moses Say, Lord, show me your glory. Go all the way back to Exodus. God is bringing Israel out through Moses. I love this passage. Ryan and I were talking about this one day. We're talking about the glory of God. And when you look, when you think about it, there's something in God that he just deals with people graciously. <laughs> He's just gracious with folks. And we need that. And that's the one word I would use to describe God is gracious. Uh, the dispensation of grace, the dispensation of the grace of God. God is gracious. He's given out himself. But watch what Moses was like, you know, I want to see your glory, God. 
Show me your glory. Moses was closer to God than anybody. I want you just to see what happened. Um, look with me, if you will, at Exodus chapter 34. Start about verse number 4. Let's get the context there. Exodus 34, 4. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. By the way, God created the first copy of the Ten Commandments. What happened to the first copy of the Ten Commandments? Broke. Who broke them? Moses. Moses, out of anger. <laughs> Showing that man, that's what happened. Man's going to break God's commandments. God, God could have suspended those things. As soon as Moses threw them down, God could have had them things hover and come back up and say, don't do that, Moses. He let them break. Symbolic of the man breaking the law. But God didn't get mad at Moses. He says, come back up. And then he had Moses. God wrote the first one with his finger. He had Moses chisel the last one. The second one, showing that God and man working together. The law of God, the law of Moses, okay? By the way, he used a copy. He made a copy. Moses broke the originals, so don't let people fool you with that. Oh, you got to have the originals. We believe the word of God is without error in the originals. No. They use copies. The Lord Jesus never had an original copy of the law or the prophets. He, had, he had, never had the original. He had copies, okay? God. By the way, Moses hewed hew the second ones. Notice here. And he hewed two tables of stone like unto the first. And Moses rose up early in the morning and went up to Mount Sinai as the Lord had commanded him and took in his hand the two tables. So check this out. God gives Moses the first ones on Mount Sinai. Moses is chilling in his tent down on the, in the desert doing this one. He's he chiseling out. Then he takes them. He takes the tablets like this. He takes what he made in his, in his tabernacle, in his tent, and he, he goes up Mount Sinai holding these suckers. And God's going to ordain that. That's symbolic of God, how God used us men to copy out his word. It's all there. Keep going. Verse number five, and the Lord descended in a cloud. By the way, yeah, I told you if you go to YouTube or go to the internet and Google or just find Jimmy Penny Caldwell Split Rock Ministry. They show you the top of Mount Sinai in Arabia there. By the way, that's why they even went and looked for it. These people are not Pauline dispensations like you and me. I think 26. They don't, they don't understand that Paul's their apostle. They got a whole other agenda to prove that Israel was the people of God. Okay? They're these, they're these believers who say, oh, we got to focus on Israel. No, you don't. But they used one verse from the Apostle Paul. Paul has hundreds and hundreds of verses. Paul says that Mount Sinai, and it was just kind of a throwaway. He was just saying, you know, I went to Mount Sinai in Arabia or something. I went to Arabia. He went to Mount Sinai in Arabia. These people are like, what the maps show right now about where Mount Sinai is, is wrong. Mount Sinai is in the Arabian Peninsula out there. There's Africa over here, okay? He said Mount Sinai is right there. So they went over there and found it. And the top of the mountain is burnt to a crisp. Why? Because when God came down, he, the mountain was on fire, and it's still burnt up there. It's fantastic to see. It's awesome. You can check that out. Why God is making that known now is when the dispensation of grace ends, the Jewish people need to see stuff like that to believe in God. The Jews got to see. They got to see things. So it's fantastic. Go check that out. You'll see the mountain burnt on top. All the rest of the mountain down there is just regular color. This one is burnt to a char on top. How did that happen? It's way up there. God came down. It's, it's this right here. Verse number five. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, Moses, there, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. Now watch this. This is what God said. And the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious. And what's the next one? Long-suffering and abundant in goodness. What I want you to see that one of the ways that God describes himself. I suffer long. God is long-suffering. Go over to Numbers chapter 14. If you're in Exodus, go a couple books forward. Leviticus, Numbers chapter 14. Just go two books forward. Numbers 14. Coming down to the end. Numbers chapter 14. 
That's why I say this is this is love that's generated by God Himself. So parents, I'm a parent. When you love your children, you're gonna suffer. Okay, gonna be some suffering. Amen. They yours, though. You have them, right, buddy? <laughs> I just messed up. I, y'all know what I got over there. That little girl. Her personality is way different than Kristen. Now, we enter her, she's just all over the place. We got to reel her in. She wakes up, it's Sunday! I got to see people. She wants to be a greeter at the door. I go, no, you can't be doing that. That's crazy, girl. All right, that girl tried to When we're in public, oh, man. Kristen, I be trying to hide. This girl singing down the aisles. Ah, let it go. Let it go. <laughs> I'm like, we're in the store here. What are you yelling out there? She's singing Annie songs. The sun will come out. People are like, hey, it's, it's, it's nuts, man. When you're an introvert, you don't want attention. It's crazy. This girl says, ah, we're gonna put it on Broadway or something. We're gonna have to move to Southern California, man. Make some money. I'll do it, girl, for real. Nah, she drives me crazy. Nah, no, I'm kidding. Long suffering. Numbers chapter 14, verse 8, 18. Numbers 14, verse 18. Verse start of verse 17. And now I beseech ye, uh, Moses speaking to God, and now I beseech thee, let the power of my Lord be great according as thou hast spoken, saying, the Lord is what? Long suffering. That's the thing that, by the way, over there in, 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 in Exodus, he says, merciful, gracious, long suffering. But notice when Moses speaks about God, he switches that around because what Moses wants God to be first is, Long suffering. Verse 18 The Lord is long suffering and of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means, oh, oh, by no means clearing the who? You know, just because God is gracious doesn't mean He just lets stuff slide. He's a righteous judge. He cannot clear the guilty. You have to deal with that sin. But notice He says, What you do? He says, visiting, uh, so if you're guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth ge generation. Pardon, I beseech thee, Moses says, the iniquity of this people, that's Israel, according to the greatness of thy mercy, as thou hast forgiven this people from Egypt until now. Okay? And the Lord said, I have pardoned how? According to thy word. God was testing Moses. Moses was interceding. And God, by Moses' faith, pardon the people. They didn't deserve it, but they did it. He did it for, for, for Moses' sake. All right, we have to end. Um, let me see here. Yeah, let's let's end in, um, I, I, I think you all get Galatians. Go to Galatians chapter number five. Yeah. Galatians. Everybody heard about the fruit of the Spirit and so forth. Galatians chapter five. Galatians chapter five. The reason the, the, the charity is, is, is produced by the Spirit of God and believer is look at Galatians chapter number five. Now we'll look at, we got two minutes, we'll look at two verses, because I, I got to end with the one that Paul says God's doing today. Look at Galatians chapter number five and verse number 22. In, in, in contrast to the works of the flesh, verse 22, Galatians five. But the fruit of the spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, long suffering, gentleness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. In other words, the law can't condemn you if you're operating like that. Okay? Now let's let's end in 1 Timothy. The greatest love that God has is displayed today. Look at 1 Timothy chapter number one, if you will. <clears throat> If you've been with me for a while, you know how I end every session. But God committed his love toward us, right? And thou, while that we were yet sinners, yet means I'm still in my sin, Christ died for me. God's love, most people say John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, whomsoever believe in him shall not perish, have everlasting life. I see it in chalk. I'm just driving, and somebody put it on the, chalk, the, the, the curb in chalk. You see the signs at all the ball games. That's good. But that was for the nation of Israel as Christ is the Messiah of earth. John 4.22 says salvation is of the who? The Jews. 
when you come to the dispensation of grace, the way God commends his love is through the death of Christ. And notice here, he also commends his love even while he's up there through long suffering. Let's end in 1 first, first Timothy chapter number 1, verse number 14. All these verses are excellent, but here we go. And the grace of our Lord, Paul writes, was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, means you can trust it, and worthy of all acceptation. No, no, there should be no, uh, there should be no one disputing this. If you listen to Paul, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save what sinners, of whom I am chief. Remind me to show you this passage in, in the Q and A. Paul's going to. Uh, Peter says. If the righteous scarcely be saved, okay? In Israel's program, we were talking about the rice, righteous are hardly saved. Huh. In, that, in that program, I'm going to show you that. <clears throat> People who are, who are declared righteous by God, they're hardly saved. They don't, many of them don't endure to the end, like John 666. They won't get into that kingdom. We'll, we'll look at that in the QA, okay? That'll tell you you get the right to divide, because even the righteous in Israel are hardly saved. So, okay? We're sinners. Watch this. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul was the head in line. Verse 16, how be it for this cause, saving sinners, I obtain what? Mercy. God saved them, gave them a ministry. I obtain mercy. That in me, what's that next word? First. Paul was the first member of the body of Christ. He was the first person that God ever dealt with like this. By grace, through faith, plus no works. He was the only person that was, he was the first person that God ever saved forever by God's grace, through faith in Christ, and no works. That was Paul. Okay. That in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all what? Long suffering. For a pattern to them which should hereafter, from Paul on after, believe on him to what? Life, life everlasting. Rest. By faith alone you have life everlasting. Paul was the first, and in this dispensation of grace until the rapture, if you trust Christ, God will give you everlasting life. Grace through faith was no works. Now, Jesus Christ does suffer. i got to end with that. He's suffering right now. By people rejecting his truth, his word. By rejecting the word of the mystery, like the world does, like most saints do, our Lord Jesus Christ is suffering. That's why when you receive this mystery word, you if you suffer with him, Romans 8, 17, that's the only way you're suffering, by being rejected, this truth, the mystery of Christ. If you suffer with him, you'll receive the same glory he does. You'll rule and reign as a joint with Christ. With Christ. You suffer with him, you reign with him. That's what it's all about, okay? If you're listening today and you never had anyone love you enough to ask you if you were to die today, do you know for sure where you're going to spend eternity? You don't know of any religion that ever tells you how you can know for sure. Because religion can't. Religion is binding yourself, re, again, religion to bind yourself back to God. God never told us to bind ourselves back to him. He says, I bound myself to you through the blood of my son. And if your religion can't tell you that if you die right this moment, you know for sure you're going to be with the Lord Jesus, it's not worth it. Stop it. Come to the Lord Jesus Christ, the faith, a person. He shed his blood on the cross for our sins, for yours. Make it personal. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for dying for me on that cross, shedding your blood. Everlasting life like we just saw. Now what to do after you're saved? Well... There, there is the life of Christ to be formed in you. That's the work of faith, the labor of love, patience, and hope. Now, when you do that over the course of time, as the Lord tarries, redeeming your time, you're going to reign with him. That's the hope of the gospel, okay? We'll help you with all of that. If you have questions, we're here for you. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, your truth. We thank you for understanding uh, more and more each, each day, each week that we meet together, uh, what it means to be in Christ. It's more than just a position of safety. It is that. No, no, no longer will we worry about hell and lake of fire. 
But Father, it is, it is a life to be lived, a life to be, uh, to be learned and lived. And that's why we do the work of faith. When we believe it, it becomes your love, your, the labor of love for you, Father, and with you and through you. And then we know we're going to suffer the attack of Satan. But we can endure it, knowing that soon the cessation of grace will be over. We'll be able to serve with you and for you forever, man, in peace and harmony. We wait for that day. But until then, we redeem the time. We endure the satanic sufferings, Father. The course of this world and the policy of evil, knowing that we'll be rewarded at the judgment seat of Christ. We'll reign with our Lord Jesus Christ. And that means it's worth it. We thank you for our time together. As we have our Q&A, we, we give you thanks and praise in Christ's name.